if there's one thing that we want uh, everyone to understand here is we look at rural Idaho and we understand the strong economic vitality of rural Idaho. And that vitality is there is because of agriculture. Um, what we fail to sometimes recognize as society is that that value is because of our labor force. So if you look specifically at the dairy industry, we have roughly 8,100 employees in the dairy industry. The vast majority of those employees in our own estimation would say 85% are Hispanic and foreign born labor. Uh, and they bring value. So you, you look at the uh, 10.4 billion economic uh, indicators of the dairy industry and what it does for the state of Idaho. If you look at the 160 million we pay in taxes um, and all sorts of taxes, that all stands on the shoulders of foreign born labor. We've worked for the last decade on trying to get immigration reform accomplished. And uh, we're here because we haven't succeeded and that and but it's time um, that there is success we have a opportunity uh, under the current administration who's elevated the debate on immigration uh, to work towards sound sensible immigration reform and so uh, we appreciate all of you being here uh, we do have two faces up here that um, weren't identified on your uh, notice one is Juan, who's filling in for, for Margie uh, today, and the other one's Priscilla Salant. Uh, Priscilla has done a lot of work on looking at the uh, value of uh, foreign-born labor and the economic impact, and she's going to explain a little bit about that study. So th thank you very much again for joining us. So on behalf of the Idaho Commission on Hispanic Affairs, we really want to thank the Idaho Dairymen's Association for um, putting every, all this together today. Um, it was a great um, lunch that we had where we were able to pull in leaders from around the state, Hispanic leaders from around the state, to come and have an open dialogue, which was really important to us. Um, and we were, we're going to continue doing these kind of forums <clears throat> throughout the state to talk about this issue. It's a very um, important issue that needs to be um, talked about, discussed. So we're really fortunate that we have partners like the McClure Center and the Idaho Dairymen's Association. Um, this, like um, Mr. Norbaut said, um, a, about 85% of the people who do work in the ag field are Hispanic, and um, that's something, and that's who we represent. And we want to make sure that everybody's being treated fairly, um, that there's some kind of sensible reform that's being um, put out there. Um, and we want to make sure that um, our people are be, feel, feel protected, and so we're um, that's what we're here for. But we will be throughout. This summer, we're going to be traveling extensively through a lot of rural Idaho to be putting on a lot of these forums um, throughout the state. So thank you. Thank you. My name is Priscilla Salant. I'm recently retired from the University of Idaho. And I'm here today to report briefly on a study that we conducted at the McClure Center for Public Policy Research at the University of Idaho. The study is an update of one we conducted in 2008, 2009, just as Idaho was coming out of the recession. And the focus of both studies was to look at the impact of the dairy industry's workforce on communities in Idaho. In particular, the study that we just released last week on Thursday was it, in particular to look at the impact of the foreign-born labor force in the Magic Valley itself and the communities in the Magic Valley. There are about 5,000 workers in the dairy industry in the Magic Valley. That's on the production side, the, the milk production side. Another 2,000 workers in the Magic Valley in the processing, the milk processing side. And, and the bottom line from our report in terms of how this workforce impacts communities is that on balance, there are tremendous economic benefits from this workforce. Um, the people who work on dairy farms are um, experienced, they're trained, they're largely foreign born, and they, many of them, have families and are well integrated into the communities of the Magic Valley. They, they've come, moved to communities purchased homes, sent their children to schools in communities that might otherwise be losing population. Their children are in schools that might otherwise be losing enrollment. So um, they are vital parts 
uh, members of communities in the Magic Valley. There are challenges that they bring insofar as there are still language barriers. In particular, the challenge we identified is that many schools in the Magic Valley are ill-equipped to serve the students and their families if the students and families are not fluent in English. And so the barriers, to the extent they exist, are around language. And the recruitment of a bilingual workforce in schools, in the justice system, in the healthcare system, would benefit the communities and the people who work in the dairy industry. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Charlie Garrison. I work in Washington, D.C. on federal policy issues, and one of the groups that I work with is the Idaho Dairymen's Association. Uh, I can tell you for IDA that immigration reform is priority number one, two, and three. Uh, you might, might be able to go a little farther down the list on that one, too. But um, um, IDA has been working on this issue for more than a decade in Washington, D.C trying to uh, work with uh, the four members of the Idaho delegation to come up with visa reform that would be effective for the dairy producers in the state of Idaho. And um, we have been at uh, the table for the negotiation of the Senate bill in 2013. Uh, IDA is at the table negotiating the um, uh, bill in the House of Representatives with the Judiciary Committee now. Uh, again, trying to come up with uh, visa reform that would be effective, uh, that would offer uh, legal status, uh, work authorization for the workers who are currently here. Uh, it would offer a new program uh, that guarantees dairies access to workers who work year-round. Uh, and it would, it would set, set up a new program for um, uh, legal new workers when they're needed in the future. So those are uh, the priorities. And um, we have uh, two of the four members of the Idaho delegation on Judiciary Committee, Senator Crapo on the Senate Judiciary Committee, and uh, Congressman Labrador on the House Judiciary Committee. Those are the committees of jurisdiction for immigration reform. And we look forward to working with them over the course of the next few months to uh, develop and pass legislation uh, on immigration reform that works for Idaho's dairy producers. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ali Narani. I'm uh, the executive director of the National Immigration Forum. And first and foremost, I want to thank the Idaho Dairymen Association and the Hispanic Commission for pulling together uh, the, the meeting today and to, uh, this afternoon's event, press event. Uh, I've spent the last couple of days in um, Idaho. Yesterday we were in Magic Valley meeting with uh, dairy producers and today here in Boise meeting with community leaders. And I have left the two days with a much greater appreciation of the the uh, the depend how much the Idaho family who is may have been here for generations who is producing milk that uh, families around the country are are drinking and eating through cheese um, and the immigrant workforce that has come here to achieve their own American dream uh, for the state of Idaho to be the third largest producer of milk in the country um, I can say just based on what I've seen and the people I've talked to I don't think the state of Idaho Idaho holds onto that ranking without the contributions of the immigrant workforce. Uh, and the immigrant workforce that we've met um, across the state uh, you know, help and really contribute to the dreams and aspirations of Americans and their own families. Um, I think that the Idaho delegation has an incredible opportunity ahead uh, to lead the nation forward in fixing our, our immigration system. Um, for years, as we've worked on this issue, Republicans have always said that you know, they didn't want to vote for immigration reform because they wouldn't get credit. Well, for the foreseeable future, Republicans get all full, get full and fair credit for everything immigration related. Um, and whether that is passing immigration reforms that serve the dairy industry or passing immigration reforms that help and uh, address the overarching problem that is facing our nation's immigration system, it can be done in a way that serves the interests and the needs of the American worker and their family. Uh, so again, we really appreciate uh, the opportunity to come to Idaho to, to meet with producers, to meet with community leaders, and we look forward to a, a, an ongoing partnership with the association and the commission. Thank you. So I think we'll both address it, Sean, but I'll, I'll start with Juan and then I'll anchor that from what we see from our producer side. 
there's a lot of fear right now um, amongst our community statewide. Um, I was just reading um, that a lot of like celebrations that are coming up, like Cinco de Mayo events and stuff, it's gonna um, have a lot less people attending because of that fear. Um, there's a lot of false um, things coming out. We're, um, for example, on our Facebook page, we're, I'm con every morning I'm constantly erasing things off of our Facebook page because people are saying there's a raid at the airport, there's a raid at the bus station, and you know it's not true. So there's a lot of falsehoods that are being po posted out there as well. And so um, we've, our agency has met with um, Boise PD and other um, police departments and they're telling us nothing's gonna be happening anytime as far as raids um, here soon, so we believe them. And so what we're really um, fighting right now is a lot of people putting fear into our community. So to, to uh, take on to what Juan said, I was asked that same question yesterday it's only appropriate, obviously, that I give the same, same answer as yesterday. I was asked on a scale of 1 to 10, what's the, uh, how serious is the uh, fear level? And I said, well, it's out of 10. Um, and I think we should all anticipate that with all the rhetoric that we hear um, coming out of D.C., all the rhetoric that was in that campaign. Um, you can only anticipate that that fear is that high. So when you look at the fear, number one, um, it, it goes, starts with our employees. Um, and, and so it's a moral fear more than an economic fear. Obviously, cattle, uh, unlike construction jobs where if there's not labor there, you set down your hammer and you come back the next day, uh, cattle have to be fed. They have to be milked every day, 365. So you have that economic fear. But it's more than moral fear. Um, had one, one uh, labor on one of our dairies uh, in a previous incident came up to, to the uh, owner of the farm and uh, to the best of our knowledge, all of our labor force is legal. They have all the proper documentations that we can assess. But he, he asked them, uh, he said, if my wife and I are deported, are you going to take care of my children? So I think you have to realize the, the uh, moral side of this equation and the amount of fear that brings to people that I don't think any of us can understand unless you're put in that same position. So from a national perspective, I would just say that um, you know, the, the president's executive orders have done a couple of things. Um, and from a policy perspective, they have uh, called for a, a real ramping up in, in immigration enforcement uh, uh, personnel and, and it really, frankly, an elimination of priorities. As a result, we've seen two things. One is a destabilization of workforces across the country, where, you know, whether or not a raid happens, somebody's going to work scared about what's going to happen, what may happen. And that has a very destabilizing effect on their ability to do their job. And we see this not only in agriculture, we're also seeing this in the tech industry and other industries across the country. And the second is that it's also uh, the anxiety and the fear is also had a very, having a very destabilizing effect on public safety. Um, when you have uh, victims of domestic violence, when you have witnesses to crimes not reporting those crimes, uh, um, the cop on the street can't do their job. The cop on the street depends on having a trusting relationship uh, with the entirety of their community, documented or not, in order to fulfill their mission to serve and protect their city or town. Uh, so just the destabilizing impact um, of these executive orders um, and the rhetoric, I think, is having uh, a public safety as well as a, an economic impact. Uh, this is an important message to deliver uh, to the community, to our workers, so I wanted to add my two cents here. Uh, the administration, uh, is adamant that their um, priorities are individuals who are deemed a threat to public safety or national security. And everything we've seen so far uh, says that that's true. The um, workplace has been the site of detention a, a time or two, but there's no, no evidence to indicate that workplaces are some sort of target. Um, and that's important for people to know that it's safe for them to show up to work each day. And they don't have to worry about their place of employment being a target for enforcement action. And another thing that we're seeing um, through our agency is schools. We're seeing, since the election, we've seen a lot more bullying happening in the schools. We've seen um, bullying happening at um, sporting events. We've seen um, um, students that are not going to school because they fear of being bullied. And when the bullies are being, when the parents of the bullies being um, approached, the parents are saying, well, we agree with what our child is saying, you know, because the child is, you know, being told, well, we're going to build a wall around you or you need to go back home. And so through that bullying, um, the teacher approaches the parent and the parent is saying, well, I agree with my child. And so teachers are also caught in the crosshairs thinking, so now what do I do if the parent agrees with the bullying?
So I think the purpose of what we're doing is, is to, to reach everybody who might be in the middle. Um, you obviously have those who understand, you have those who might understand and be opposed. Um, I, I would have to say that uh, part of what we need to do is elevate the debate so that instead of immigration being a back burner issue in Washington, D.C., it's a front burner issue. Um, you know, the fact that immigration won't be looked at until the fall because uh, health care is first, taxes are second, we hope to get to it uh, in the fall. Uh, it's a little sad. I mean, we've been working on this for decades. We, we uh, in Obama's first administration, uh, he was going to do immigration and health care. Well, he only got health care done, and after that he lost, he, he lost the majority in the House side, so we, he didn't move into immigration. So I, I think our delegation members have to understand, and that's part of what we're trying to do. Part of why we delivered the petitions to them, it's part of why we are uh, working so closely with the Hispanic Commission that we haven't done before, is to make sure enough pressure and continuing pressure is put on our delegation members so it elevates uh, immigration reform to the level we feel it needs to be elevated to. Well, I, I think that, um, you know, by and large, the, the, nation, the nation's immigration debate, when you look at it in terms of fixing the problem, it seems to always be driven by Democrats. Um, I think that the Idaho delegation has an incredible opportunity because uh, it's a state that increasingly depends on Im immigrants in order to create uh, jobs and, and a prosperous future for American, American workers and their families in Idaho. Uh, so as one of the most conservative states in the country that, you know, whose economy is so closely linked to the immigrant workforce, I think that you know, this delegation can you know, really kind of, can really change the debate. Um, I think that, yes, it will take a, a certain amount of political courage on their part, um, but you know what? Good politics makes for very good policy. Um, and, or maybe it's the other way around, you know? <laughs> good policy makes for very good politics. Um, because, you know, the best thing that can happen in D.C. these days is a big surprise. And a big surprise that leads to a, a, a reformed immigration system. And I just can't think of a delegation in a better position to surprise Washington, D.C. with um, some real political leadership. That's really true. When you, and I mentioned that, that two of the four are on the committees of jurisdiction. Uh, Raul Labrador is not only on the committee of jurisdiction, he's vice chairman of the immigration subcommittee of the House Judiciary Committee. Uh, the other House member, Mike Simpson, has a lot of seniority. He's a um, chairman of the subcommittee on the Appropriations Committee. Um, Senator Crapo is on the Judiciary Committee. Uh, Senator Risch knows agriculture as well as anybody in the state knows agriculture. So the, the Idaho delegation is uniquely positioned to understand the issue on behalf of agriculture, on behalf of dairy farmers in Idaho, and um, uniquely positioned to be helpful because of uh, their roles in the House and the Senate to be helpful. Well, uh, our attitude, and uh, certainly Bob makes the effort to come to Washington, D.C., oh, I don't know, four or five, six times a year. And immigration reform is always uh, the first priority when he's meeting with uh, all of the uh, members of the delegation. So it, it's important for us, it's important for everybody across the country to keep the pressure on your elected officials, keep the pressure on your folks in Washington. You know, Im immigration is uniquely the territory of the federal government. Only the Congress can fix this issue. And so that's why it's so important for IDA to stay engaged with uh, their two senators and two House members, but it's also important for us to keep working with uh, other states, other areas of the country, so that um, uh, the people we work with and organizations like IDA keep the pressure on uh, their delegations as well. I, I would just say that, um, you know, as I've learned about the the Idaho dairy industry, a couple of things. So first, some, some numbers as, as I remember them. Um, there are just under 600,000 uh, dairy, dairy cows here in Idaho. That means that every day there are nearly 600 cows that need to be milked, that, that milk needs to be delivered. Um, and the unemployment rate in the Magic Valley is around 3%. So it's an incredibly tight labor market with an incredible demand for skilled labor to get this product to market. So I think from our perspective, you know, the question I would ask, I would ask of the Idaho delegation is how will they look their dairy producers in the eye 
and say, you know what, I can't do anything to help you survive. Um, because without immigrant labor, without a dynamic uh, visa system that meets labor needs within the dairy industry, um, these are farms that are really going to they're really going to struggle in the days and the years ahead. And I think it's the up to the congressional delegation of Idaho to lead the way forward. So I'd like to tie together two questions that you asked. One is who needs to be reached, and also why is Idaho in a unique position right now? In fact, I think that members of the general public need to be reached. I think there's a grave misconception out there in the general discussion that there are floods of a flood of foreign born workers coming into Idaho. In fact, the best estimates that we have are from the Pew Research Center and their work on estimating how many undocumented workers there are in every state. In Idaho, there were 45,000 undocumented immigrants uh, in 2009, and their best estimate coming from the Pew Research Center is that there are still 45,000 undocumented immigrants in Idaho. That means no net increase. We know that net immigration right now from Mexico is zero. Zero. There are there isn't a flood of, of um, foreign-born workers coming into Idaho, and so our research really looked at what happens in communities when there are no more um, foreign-born workers coming in. And, and what we found is that there's a tremendous labor sh shortage at current wage rates. The foreign-born workers are taking jobs, willing to work at jobs that native-born workers are not willing to take at current wage rates. And so you see the labor shortage playing out in not only in dairy, but in other um, parts of the economy in the Magic Valley. And so you would think there'd be upward pressure on wages, but dairy is a globally competitive industry, and the margins, as best as we could see, are not large enough to absorb major increases in the prevailing wage. So they're really Really caught in a bind and if the industry is caught in a bind then the communities of Idaho are caught in a bind because the foreign-born workers live in the communities of, of the Magic Valley. So, so the, the impact on dairy right now is, is extremely significant and what happens is uh, we have one dairy it's here in Treasure Valley that his labor force is down 35 percent from where it was before. And so you try and get creative on how you're moving labor around. But if you look at uh, all the economic factors that the rural Idaho, so I think you also have to look at broader than just the dairy industry, but rural Idaho, all the economic factors it brings, it stands on the shoulders of foreign bone labor. And so if there's a significant reduction, in it, and it doesn't, it doesn't matter where that reduction occurs, but when labor's at 3%, let's say it's not the dairy industry that's losing labor, but another industry, you're in competition. Competition does raise the wages. There's no doubt about that. But there's also some people who are going to be left un unfilled for jobs or jobs that are going to be un unfilled with labor. And so when you look at it, uh, the, the dairy cow is a uh, living organism. It's got to be fed. It's got to be milked. And that happens uh, on a daily basis. And milking happens two to three times a day. And so you, it's not like you can lay down your, your construction hammer and say, I don't have the labor today. So I'll come back to building tomorrow. It has to function. If it doesn't function, then you have some choices as a dairy producer. Do you downsize and make the amount of animals you have equivalent to the amount of labor you need? Um, do you, uh, we have some dairymen who we're looking at expanding who won't expand because there's not a labor force. Uh, you will see some increase in mechanization, uh, but that's a long-term process. That's not a short-term, it's a big investment. It's a long-term process. And uh, quite frankly, when you're working with an animal like a, a cow, there's some mechanization that's just not going to occur. Um, you, you need that human touch, that human observation for that animal. So there's no, there's no upside for a shortage of labor for the dairy industry. There's only downsides, and some of those are pretty significant. So the industry has been looking at alternatives down the road if this never gets worked out. Yeah, so, so you look at mechanization. So uh, as an industry as a whole, um, robotic milkers are, are new and upcoming. And that works for some of the smaller operations. It, that Nobody's demonstrated how you can fully utilize robotic milkers on very large operations. Eventually that will come. It's a very expensive proposition. So uh, 
the price is coming down as, as mechanization is becoming uh, more prevalent, um, but you still are going to spend at least 160000 to 200000 uh, per machine to milk 60 cows. So when you have the average dairy in Magic Valley with 1,500 cows, you can't look at the current available mechanization and say that's going to work. Um, is the future in mechanization across all of agriculture? Uh, the answer would be yes, but that's nothing new. If you go back of how much agriculture has proceeded in, in the last 20, 30, 40 years, the mechanization has been pretty significant. Talking about percentages, uh, whether whether something might might actually be able to happen, you know, there's um, there's room for a deal there. There's room for a compromise. If we can get, you, know, you, you just sort of have to take the the two ends of the perspective of the spectrum. You have to take those sort of off the table. The, the people who will uh, try to block anything that's not perfect. And the people who will try to block anything. Period. Uh, and then work. You know, those those. Okay, let's say that that's 10% on both sides. You've still got 80% in the middle to try to uh, convince that if you've got priorities on interior enforcement, if there are things that, that you would like to see on that front, um, if agriculture is happy with a, a visa program that you want to propose alongside it, then there's room for a deal there. And everybody gets what they want, everybody gets what they need, except for those two extremes that I talked about before. So I'm optimistic we could get there. Uh, we've got to clear some other things off the legislative agenda, some other priorities that have to go first. Uh, for example, uh, the health care issue has to be resolved before uh, the, the Congress can move on to tax reform because you don't know what tax reform has to look like before you resolve um, the uh, health care insurance issue. So things are kind of stacked that way. But we also believe that um, there's room for a message to, to be delivered to Congress that Congress does have the ability to do, the, to do more than one big thing at a time. And so let's be working on, and we are, uh, negotiating an ag package uh, while the rest of the House is working on health care and while they're going to be working on tax reform. So if there's room to move an issue like immigration reform in the fall, I'm convinced we'll be ready. Uh, we're going to need folks like Ali and um, our allies in uh, the general immigration reform community to help us try to keep nudging the Congress to, to be willing to tee something up. But I'm convinced we'll be ready. I, I don't do percentages like that. Um, and I also think you have to be realistic that Immigration reform needs to happen in 2017 because as soon as the calendar turns to 2018, uh, all eyes are on the midterm elections and immigration reform is difficult enough to do in a non-election year. So we, we need to keep the focus on being ready and again, working with a lot of different organizations nationwide to convince the Congress that this is something that should be dealt with it's um, good policy. It's the compassionate thing to do. Business clearly needs this. Farmers know. Other bus businesses know. There are no other workers coming behind people uh, to look for work. So this issue needs to be fixed, and it needs to be fixed sooner rather than later.